Hey everybody, I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio. My good friend Robert Phoenix from 11th House, Astro uh, 11th House Astrology and RobertPhoenix.com is with me. And we are here to do Matrix Mash. Is this number four or five? I think it might be four. Four, yeah. Sorry for the long uh, intermission between shows. Uh, both Robert and I have been dealing with uh, uh, some health issues. As you see, I have a cold, some traveling, some other stuff just going on and so this is the first opportunity we've had to get back together and do it but we're excited to do so so we're gonna break it all down and solve all the world's problems in about 37 minutes all righty robert what you got how you doing hey i'm great <laughs> emily um and if we don't solve them at least we'll have a good time <laughs> taking a crack at it right yeah yeah taking a crack at it or taking a crap on them either one right <laughs> either way we could well we'll you know the sacred to the profane um <laughs> So you, you've got some updates for the gymnastic stuff, right? Yeah, I just want to kind of hit on this first because it is something that Robert and I have covered consistently for all of 2018. In fact, the first show Robert and I did together this year was when I was on your show and we did the first interview about it and we've covered it here and off planet and through with Matrix Mash and whatever. And so this implosion of USA Gymnastics continues and it's, you know, like the weirdest thing going on because the U.S. gymnasts continue to dominate. They won the, the world championships last month by several points, but USA Gymnastics and the uh, sick culture around it continues to be exposed and the organization uh, to be just completely falling apart. And the latest, you know, I follow it from time to time. I have a limited amount of bandwidth for that because of the personal effect that it has on me. And so I pop in and out. I can't follow every little single last detail. For people who are interested in following every last detail, Scott Reed on the Orange County Register does a great job at covering this. And then the folks over at the Gymcastic Podcast, too. Um, I appreciate their work. I think they're a little, um, they have some blinders on to what's really going on in the world. The podcast sometimes veers into SJW territory, but they have been relentless in their coverage of, of this, you know, sexual abuse issue. And I appreciate the work that they do. So if you want, like, all the play-by-play -play on that stuff, you guys can go there. But what has been happening over the last couple of months is that uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee has moved to decertify USA Gymnastics, which on the surface sounds at this point, because USA Gymnastics can't get its shit together, like a good idea. However, you know, there is possible ulterior, you know, people at the U.S. Olympic Committee aren't guilt-free in this either. They knew about this for a long time before they did anything. And there is a lot of evidence, as Scott Reed has pointed out, that this move to decertify may actually be to help USA Gymnastics move into bankruptcy before a trial with Ali Raceman, who has been the most sort of outspoken of the gymnasts and the most insistent that this is BS and, you know, that, you know, documents aren't being turned over, things aren't being done. She's actually been quite, um, quite good. Uh, she has a lawsuit going, and it seems that the USA Gymnastics want, and the U.S. Olympic Committee want to avoid discovery. And one way you can avoid discovery is by declaring bankruptcy before the trial starts, and the certification of USA Gymnastics would help with that process. So this isn't necessarily a holistic reason behind why U U.S. Olympic Committee may be moving to decertify USA Gymnastics. And uh, as well, more and more and more elite and collegiate gymnasts continue to come out and talk about their abuse from Larry Nasser or from other coaches. And as I said from the very beginning, by the time this is all said and done, it really is going to be, I'm not going to say everyone, but in the scheme of things, almost everyone. This has been going on as long as I've known gymnastics, which has been since I was two years old. It's prevalent. It's not the anomaly. It's the norm. The anomaly is the kid who escapes gymnastics without some sort of physical, psychological, emotional, or sexual abuse. And the same thing goes for, I think, really at this point, the status in our country. Um, and I've been looking at this thing with USA Gymnastics as really a microcosm or a small, a smaller version of what's really going on with our government. And it's even occurred to me that they could this de the way that USA Gymnastics is imploding and de the demolition of it is almost like a playbook for how like they're testing out to see what's going to happen when this happens with the regular government. I mean, really, you know, like 
they're, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to pin all of this stuff on one guy and make it seem like it's just about one thing in one place when really it's a widespread problem. It's a systemic so like issue. Like Larry Nasser is like Trump or vice Larry versa? Na yes, Larry Nasser is like Trump or like Dennis Hastert or whatever, right? There's just this one bad guy and if we, or the Franklin scandal, there's just this one issue or this one bad guy when the truth of the matter right. is, is it's more the norm and there's sacred cows that are being protected, right? That is why- yeah, So it's the scapegoat politics is what you're talking about. So there's that, and then there's this whole thing, and I think it's, I still think, and this is my criticism of most of these people, including the people at the gymnastics podcast, Jessica Burn and Spencer Barnes, who I like a lot of the stuff they do, they seem to be oblivious to how the world really works, and I can't fault them on a certain level, because I was oblivious until I understood, but I would just hope that through this process, they become aware of some of this stuff. And then even people who are directly involved in the case, like Rachel Denhollander, she was just introduced at Sports Illustrated Woman of the Year thing the other day by Christine Blasey Ford, right? So there's this tie here, like, hello, Rachel Den Hollander, you're smart, you're an attorney. Christine Blasey Ford works for people who are, you know, has been trained and in cahoots and working with people who run government mind control, MKL, three kinds of programs since her 20s. Look it up, right? So you might want to be careful about who you feel comfortable being honored by or having anything to do with, because I guarantee you, her situation is not the same as these gymnasts, and she does not have your honor or your best interests in mind. There is something else going on here. And, you know, please, not for my sake, but for the sake of yourself and all these other people out here, you know what I mean? Go take a look at what's really going on. And then you have this whole thing, you know, these, gym, these, these gymnasts are looking to the government to help. Right. And the government is just as corrupt or more corrupt. Like this gymnastics scandal to USA Gymnastics is no different than what Pedogate or Pizzagate is to our government. And just so you guys know, Pizzagate has nothing to do with a sex slave ring being run out of the bottom of a pizza parlor. That is the cover up story that the mainstream media made it about. So people wouldn't actually look into the content of the Podesta emails in the WikiLeaks. Go look at that. Look at the coding. And that is what Pizzagate is about. Okay. Like, you know, this is something that's going on on both sides. This isn't just about Democrats. It's about Democrats and Republicans, high-level politicians, all the way down to police departments, right? This is a systemic problem, just like sexual abuse in USA Gymnastics. Now, what's happening is, is USOC is moving to decertify, which mean that they would, means that they would temporarily sort of take over this until some new kind of governing body could be installed. Sound familiar, guys? And then also FIG, which is the Federation of International Gymnastics, is starting to be concerned with some of this stuff. Well, this to me sounds like, okay, so just play with this for a second, right? When people finally, finally, finally get it about what's going on with our government, whether it be on just a political level or on this deeper pedophilia, you know, sex slave, you know, trade kind of stuff going on, people are going to be pissed, right? And everyone's going to be mad at the government. People are going to sue, right? And at that moment, you know, the, the, the government will say that we're a corporation and we're declaring bankruptcy, right? And so there'll be no discovery and we can't pay, right? Because our government is a corporation, just like USA Gymnastics ultimately is. They pose as governing bodies when really they are corporations in a financial business. And then the UN or some other kind of international body will move to, you know, take over the United States while this all gets cleaned up and there'll be idiots on the sideline cheering going, this is a good idea. You know what I mean? So this, this thing that's going on with USA Gymnastics is like a small blueprint of what could happen on a larger scale. And I just implore people to take a look at it, especially people in the gymnastics community. You are being used. You are not being dealt with in the holistic manner that you think you are. This is not a criticism of people who are doing the work and doing the activism, but the, there's no one in the US government going to help you, right? Just, just like there's nobody in USA Gymnastics that was going to help you. They're running the show. Right. And, you know, I just, so, you know, I have to, t you know, control my feelings about this because it does take an effect on my ability to sleep and my health and whatever and whatnot, because there, there is some personal attachments to this for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I can't follow every little move, but it, I, this is upsetting to me. When my dad sent me the uh, article that talked about Christine Blasey Ford introducing Rachel Den Hollander, I just about vomited in my mouth. You know, to me, that was like that. There's your connection right there. Right. There's the connection that this, there's something fishy going on. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting that you've made a connection between uh, these two models and one model being one that, you know, is kind of being road tested. And I mean, I mean, clearly the similarities are there. I mean, uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's, you just look at it and it clear as day. 
un- unfortunately, you know, getting to a point where people can actually, you know, tear things apart and break them down. Uh, it, I mean, it's happening, you know, but, it, but it, it's, you know, getting to a place where people who have a certain perspective or point of view to get them to that point, it's going to take a little bit more, you know, it's like, uh-huh. be, because a lot of people are convinced. I mean, even in our world, right. In our alternative research, whatever you want to call it world, there are people that are so convinced that they have the right answers. They've got the point of view. They've got the model broken down and clearly there, there are holes in their game, right? Uh-huh. There are, you know, so I, I think it exists on both sides, but, but, it feels to me like for your 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 peeps at the uh, at the at the gymnastics podcast. It's called gymnastic. If people want to go check it out, gymnastic. I mean, it, it's it's like it, it, in order for people to really understand kind of what's happening in a big picture level, I think we all have to sort of let go of at some level of our attachments mm-hmm. as to how the world works. Yeah. Um, and when we do that, then we can begin to see more clearly as to some of the dynamics behind these things. And they're not pretty. I mean, you know, when you really get down to it, the, the world is at, an, at a high level, at a political level, is a series of organized gangs. It's what it is. Yep. They're, they're gangs that wear ties and have initials after their names. And sometimes they work together and sometimes they war against one another. But it's but it, we're we're being essentially led around the planet by gangs, uh-huh. and yep. that's the most basic and fundamental place that you can start. And 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 when you get there, it's like you realize that you know, like like if you go into say a um, little Italy in New York around the 1920s or the 30s, where you saw the sort of the formation of La Cosa Nostra and the gangs. I mean, they, they, were, they were running everything, right? And there was some level of, how do I say this, um, kind of looking after people uh-huh. on some level, right? It was in there. But at the same time, they were also terrorizing people simultaneously, right? And that's kind of the model. You know, there's some looking after us, you know, uh, at, at, at kind of a high level. But there's also this other program that's going on that intimidates us and brings out well, a lot of fear. Part of the reason that the government wanted to infiltrate the mafia was not to bring them down, but to understand how they worked because the mafia ran a tighter ship than the government ever could. Well, clearly, that's what Saul yeah. Alinsky did. You know, yeah. Saul Alinsky studied at the elbow of Al Capone. Yep. And, um, you know, and he, and he learned a lot of his psychological tactics from Al Capone. Yeah. Uh, then you have this weird kind of, fusion between like the Giancanas and the Kennedys and Sinatra, uh-huh. and, you know, this, there's this a very interesting kind of miscegenation, you know, between the mob and the government in the early sixties yeah. that takes place as well. So, I mean, there's sort of, it's, it's been kind of infused in some ways. And, but once people figure out that we're just dealing with gangs, then, then, you know, we have a better opportunity to kind of understand and see it from from a you know from the perspective that it's, it's more real in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, the last piece I wanted to update on because the last show we did was the Ron Gallimore connection show that Ron Gallimore, not long after that show, did resign his position at USA Gymnastics. He's still, I believe, on the board or has his position at FIG. But note, he was not fired by USA Gymnastics. He chose to resign. So mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of interesting, and it, some of it goes to some of the forecasting you made about him. So he'll be another figure to see to keep an eye on and see what happens. I have a feeling that it's possible that some of this stuff not wanting to be discovered is partly to cover up things having to do with Ron Gallimore because he was tagged in all of those emails. So he always knew what was going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he may be the great, you know, secret keeper or real greaser of this whole operation. So let's not forget, you know, the, the sort of the ground zero for this is Michigan state, Michigan state and yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and Ann Arbor and anybody who knows anything about Kathy O'Brien knows that Kathy Ann Arbor, O'Brien. Ann Arbor is University of Michigan. Michigan I'm sorry, State, I'm sorry. It's the other one. I think Michigan State, I think, is Lansing or something. Lansing, sorry, my bad. It's Lansing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, but but Kathy, so Michigan, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and Kathy O'Brien came from Michigan. That's where she grew up. 
Well, that's there's lots of people get. from projects and programs that have lived in or, or, or born in or have been through Michigan. We have so many of the uh, music stars and things like that. Madonna's from Michigan. Madonna's from Michigan, Michael Jackson, you know, a lot of all techno music comes from there. Motown music comes from there, all this kind of stuff. And um, there, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting things that sort of go on there in Michigan. Um, I, yeah. Here's what I think. Well, I, also, I Michigan think, State was involved in uh, the Phoenix program and all the stuff that, that went on in Vietnam. They've been involved in uh, police training and you know police training like with programs back and forth to Israel. You know, there's all sorts of and and I, this is I mean, this is far out on the on the conspiracy limb, but I do think it's interesting and and I'm a fan of their work on a certain level. But um, this person who's been assisting. Catherine Austin Fitz in researching the 21 trillion missing dollars is also a professor to the professor at Michigan State University. And I often wonder if some of this missing 21 trillion dollars from government is going to fund programs through some of these, you know, universities and athletic programs and things like that. Right. So um, I find it interesting. That, you know, I, I don't know. That's a far connect, but my brain does that stuff. Right. My brain is like, oh, that's interesting. Mark Skinner showed up about the same time talking about this with the 21 trillion. Now he seems to have no, con I mean, he, he, I was listening to him on, on uh, James Corbett this morning. Like he seems to be an earnest researcher or whatever, but it's so funny that these things pop up. There's all of these programs being run through Michigan state university. Right. So we have to be suspicious of things that come out of that. I mean, at this point I'm suspicious of all the major universities. I'm suspicious oh, of UCLA and Berkeley and Harvard and yeah, all of them. And some of these are schools that I've been to, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it feels like if you pull the thread enough, with Larry Nasser in uh, gymnastics in a Michigan State, it, it could it could have that kind of Kathy O'Brien effect. That's totally. that's what it feels yep. like to me. Yep, yep. Yeah, and you're dealing you're dealing with high levels of government. Well, good work, Emily. We good update. Yeah. All right. What you got, man? Well, you know there are a couple of things that I that I've been looking at, and you and I have been talking about um, like Pete Davidson got on my radar. Uh huh. And, 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 and for a number of reasons, because it seems like, you know, like if you follow the history of Saturday Night Live, there's, it's been kind of this uh, breeding ground for stars, cinema, movies. They graduate from Saturday Night Live to, you know, Chevy Chase, John Belushi, you name it, right? But there's also really interesting and tragic kind of connection to people also on Saturday Night Live. Uh, Chris Farley, Belushi, both of whom are dead. Um, Chevy Chase went through, you know, kind of a real serious issue with, you know, substances and coke. I mean, he probably brought that into the show anyway. But so we've so we've got this interesting, weird breeding ground with Saturday Night Live. And, you know, every now and then there's somebody that pops up like the mushroom and Jimmy Fallon being, you know, another example. Well, the latest is this guy, Pete Davidson. And Pete Davidson is quite different than a lot of other people from Saturday Night Live because he was one of the youngest members ever to be a full cast member. Like uh, Anthony Michael Hall was a part-time cast member when he was much younger. But he was not a full-time cast member. I'm yeah. screen sharing some of this, yeah. And there we go. So here we have, this is Pete Davidson. And uh, his background is fairly dark and interesting. He's from Staten Island. Uh, New York City, and his father uh, was one of the people that died on 9-11. And this is a really important piece to understand because he represents, in a, in a very kind of concentrated way, sort of the traumatized version of his generation, right? So you're wearing, looking at somebody... What he's wearing. What's that? Oh, he's wearing a NASA shirt. Right. He also has a Hillary Clinton tattoo, which is weird. Right. And here he is with Ariana Grande, who is, of course, you know, one of the LK, MK Ultra totally. beta kittens. Yeah. So he's connected into MK Ultra just by this relationship, whether he knows it or not. And I suspect he's a smart guy and that he does. He does know it. Okay. Um, and uh, he, he, he's like this walking time bomb of trauma. Because if you look at 9-11, it was, it was an event that was, it was concocted and then it was carried out to do a lot of things. But ultimately, what it, was done, what it was done for was to traumatize the entire population. 
Uh-huh. It was a major traumatic event. Yep. And on the, on the back end of any kind of trauma, when you look at it from, say, the, the personal experiments, once somebody's traumatized, they begin to bring in the new programming, right? Yes. So everything post 9-11 has been about a new program for this country and even the world to a large extent. And much of that has to do with fear. And originally it was some level of xenophobia and religiophobia. I mean, that's part of it. But that was just a plank of fear. But isn't it so, funny how at first it was this, let's fear the Muslims, right? Let's fear the Muslims. And now it's like, let's bring them all here. <laughs> well, that's right. There was, a, there was a sea change when Obama became it's, president. Yeah, Hegelian dialectic. Yeah, when Obama that, became president, Muslims yeah. became good people again. Thesis, right? antithesis, synthesis, right? Uh-huh. The Muslims are bad. The Muslims are good. Let's bring them all here. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have a, and not only that, but you know, if you really are liberal and you follow, you know, sort of the liberal rags and listen to NPR, you have a great amount of guilt because we've been over there and blowing shit up. So let's bring them home. Let's bring. Yeah. Come on in. You know, we made a mess of your place. Come on over here. Spend the night at our house. We got we got a nice warm couch, right? I mean, there's there's part of that too. And that's part of the trauma as well, right? That's part of getting people to buy into this idea that, you know, that we're responsible on some level for these decisions that these psychopaths make. Right. And so we self-identify with, you know, sort of the trauma and so somehow trying to fix it or heal it or change it. So Pete, Pete, this Pete Davidson, his father died in one of the buildings. And so he's become kind of emblematic of this walking, talking trauma. And if you follow his story, He's also very much connected to mental illness, Uh right? So, and, and, you know, what is sort of the next big thing that we're all going to be dealing with? It's mental illness. Right. Is the person mentally fit enough? Can they buy a gun? Can they drive a car? Can they vote? Are they, can they have children? Right. If if your thoughts or feelings are anything right of center, you're mentally ill and can't vote. That's right. Absolutely. And he constantly talks about his battle with mental illness, his battle with drugs. He's, you know, he's very, you know, he seems on the surface, like he watches act and he watches bit and he's kind of going along with the heavy duty kind of liberal, progressive, right bashing, you know, platform that Saturday Night Live has taken on. I mean, that's, I I don't know if it's a good, I think it's funny for one group of people. I'm not sure it's funny for everybody. Right. There's a certain group that gets a big, big chuckle out of it. And, you know, his latest thing was he made fun of a, a guy from Texas who was running for uh, state Senate here and he lost his eye in the war. So, you know, he's got this, you know, patch on his eye. So they made fun of him on the show. Pete P- Davidson was that character. Right. And so the guy won and then he brought him onto the show so that he could sort of like, you know, make good and, you know, eat some crow or whatever. So it gives you an idea as to kind of, and he's the one, like there's a whole other, group of people on Saturday Night Live, but it's now Pete Davidson who's been singled out. Now, recently, he had a tweet where he said that he doesn't want to be on this planet anymore. And that, of course, raises the mental health bells, all that, you know, and all, but all the things. that also raises the NASA bells, right? Is that an advertisement for, quote, unquote, space travel? Or just like, okay, I'm going to understand what I'm saying here bringing him up and having him be a popular person who's been traumatized by his dad dying in, in 9-11, right? And we all have questions about what 9-11 really was and is this true that his dad... I'm not questioning him necessarily, but the whole, the whole event, what it is and what the, out, what the fall from it was and what it actually... All that stuff, it's a, a, un, we can't be sure. We can't know, right? Some people, you know, we, we don't really know exactly what happened there and, and, and whatnot, right? So bringing that up is, is, is like a way of, um, you know, bringing that issue, right? Like you want to keep that 9-11 thing going, right? And he, there he is wearing a NASA t-shirt talking about he doesn't want to be on this planet anymore, which reinforces the idea that space exists in the way people think. And then maybe I could just go to another planet, even if it's subliminally, right? He could be talking about suicide. He could be, but he didn't say, I don't want to live anymore. He said, I don't want to be on this planet anymore. Like, right. Yeah, that, oh, these earthlings are all so stupid and I could go to another planet where Hillary Clinton would be president and where, you know, or whatever kind of thing, right? Like, it's just, it's so, um, that's an interesting tweet to have. I don't want to be on this planet anymore. 
Right. So Ariana Grande, I don't know where she was, but she came rushing uh, to 40 40 Rock, right, which is where they they videotaped that show. Right. And and, uh, he wouldn't let her in. There was a big drama. The cops came. They actually came to the set of SNL. Uh, to check on him, and so so, what does that do, right? I mean, it sets in motion in people's What does the name mind. Ariana mean? We've been through this before, I think. Did we look into the meaning of her name? What does the name Ariana mean? Oh, uh, um, yeah, we did look through it before. I feel like we talk. I'm going to look it up. You keep talking. I'm going to look it up. So I think I can share screen, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll, I want to share screen with something here, and let me see if I can uh, find it. Um, I need to get back to you. Hold on. All right, I'm going to do this, and I'm just going to find it because um, this is what we're going to talk about in a bit. Yeah, right. we're going to talk about this in a bit. But I wanted to put up uh, Pete uh, Pete Davidson's chart. I don't have his birth time, but it's one of the oddest charts I've seen. But first of all, what we have is a really tight bundle. Okay, the name the name Ariana mm-hmm. is. It's a myth, is, is the name Ariana is a Latin baby name. In Latin, the meaning of the name Ariana is holy. It's a mythological Ariadne who aided Theseus to escape from the Cretan labyrinth. So is, right. is, is Pete Davidson Theseus trying to escape from this Cretan labyrinth that is planet it, Earth? It could be because, I mean, really what he was saying was like, like, I'm in hell and I want to get the hell out of here. Yeah. I mean, that's really. And she's holy. She's like his angel or something. Right, like exactly. That. Absolutely. And she's been portrayed that way. Right. You know, she was there on, on stage with Aretha Franklin and all the presidents, right? When she, well, I guess it was Aretha Franklin. Or she was, she was. When Aretha in, Franklin died. It was when she died. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think she was there on stage in her casket, right? I mean, I yeah. think she was actually physically there. Anyway, he's got the weirdest chart. Like, first of all, it's a bundle chart. And really there's, there's nothing like, this is not his birth time. And I, I, and I would say he might be a Sag rising because he's got that kind of horsey face. Yeah. But, but he's, he's got – his chart starts at, like, Jupiter and Scorpio, and it ends in Saturn and Aquarius. And these are all what we call transpersonal planets. There's nothing personal about this guy. These are all planets that are, you know, Scorpio and beyond. So he's a representative. He's, a, he's here representing something. He's, he's, he doesn't even exist. Right, he's just a representation, like a, an avatar of something. Or a, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And he's really bound up in Scorpio. He's got a Pluto-Sun conjunction. So he is connected to death at every turn of his life. Mm. And so he's here representing death. He's, he's, what, the dark, he's here representing death. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. absolutely. And he's the dark jester. So, and here's Saturn. Saturn represents the father in the chart. And he's got one square. One square, and it's the Saturn square to Pluto, which is the death of the father. It's right there. So there's nothing personal about Pete Davidson. I'd be very surprised if, the, if he makes it past the age of 30, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. This is, this, is, this is the chart of somebody who kind of flashes across our screen. Uh-huh. And I'm not saying that he's, you know, that he's going to, you know, I am saying, I am saying it. This is somebody who I think does not have a long life ahead of them because yeah, it's so. He doesn't intense. look like it. I mean, right. he looks he's, dead already. He's living with this Plutonian edge every single day. He looks dead already. If you really look at that picture of him sitting there with Ariana Grande, look he looks dead already. Yeah, absolutely. He's like a re, a re, uh, reinvigor, re, 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 you know, when they bring a reanimation, corpse, re-animation. reanimated corpse. Yeah. Yeah. So I just find it fascinating that he's somebody that keeps being pushed on, uh, you, you know, it, it's like, you know, Saturday, not, Saturday night live is there to promote their show. I mean, that's what they're there to do. Like they, and they have cast members that they, that they, um, you know, sort of, sort of rise up and, and, and bring them out into the, into the public for, you know, greater visibility. And he's that person. This is the character. This is sort of the star of Saturday Night Live that's being brought to our attention. And it's somebody who is always battling with mental illness, has been traumatized, has a connection to 9-11, um, has a, uh, an MK Ultra girlfriend, and was, was close with Mac Miller. That's another thing. The hip-hop guy that killed himself, that was one of his friends. Uh. 
Yeah. So anyway, I just thought, I, you know, why the question is, why are we getting so much of Pete Davidson? Yeah. Why, why, why is he out there? He's out there because the, the guy's a walking, talking wound. And he, and, like, and remember when we were just getting a ton, remember like back in like the nineties, I guess it was like the late nineties, or early two thousands. When every time we turned around, we were hearing about Scott Weiland being arrested or falling asleep somewhere because he was high on heroin same with Dave Gahan from Depeche Mode. And like, these are people you don't hear about in the news very often. But for a period of six months or a year, we were constantly hearing about these guys and them getting arrested, you know, buying heroin or in a bathroom somewhere or falling asleep in a car or falling asleep somewhere weird, right? And we heard about it a lot and then they're gone and some of them end up dying later. Scott Weilanders, Dave Gahan seemed to pull himself together, but you never hear about that later. There was a lot less fanfare made about Steve, uh, Scott Weiland's death than there was about all his heroin antics when he was doing it, right? And, and same with Dave Gahan. When he was a mess, that was a big thing. I just saw him last year at the Depeche Mode concert. The guy looks amazing. He looks like he's got his shit together. You don't hear about that, you know? So Ariana Grande was also, was also lovers with Mac Miller. Oh, so she's the kiss of death. She, she's a spider woman. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ariana Grande and Mac Miller had matching tattoos. And then Pete Davidson and Ariana Grande had matching. She's the kiss of death disguised as the angel who's going to save him from the, la the, the Cretan labyrinth. But she's really just going to march him straight to hell. Right. And now yeah. she's got an upside down Christmas tree, which has become the metaphor for her life. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, she's, she's a, she's an Illuminati siren. Totally. That's number one. And I think Pete Davidson is being lined up to be another sacrifice. That's, yep. that's what it feels like. Yep. Especially based on that chart. That's a heavy chart. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, in better news. <laughs> in better news, Alice Walker I love this. The eccentric Alex, Alice Walker has decided that she's going to um, stand by and um, praise David Icke, which I think is just one of the best stories in the last couple of months. Right. You, you, For you the know, people you, who haven't, who didn't see your 15 minutes of flame this morning, give a brief recap of what's going on with Alice Walker and David Icke. So Alice Walker was interviewed by the New York Times. You know, Alice Walker being the author of The Color Purple, She's an Aquarius, so she's different. You know, she's just, she's wired differently. I always thought she was really interesting. Uh -huh. um, you know, I lived in the Bay Area. She lived in the Bay Area. She seemed like she had just a really bright intellect and wasn't bound by, you, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the conventional Berkeley politics of the day. Anyway, um, she was being interviewed by the New York Times. And it's like, well, um, you know, what, what, what books do you have on your newsstand and she, or your nightstand? And she mentioned uh, David Icke, one, one of David Icke's books. And she just said, oh, it's great. You know, it's a you know, great read and lots of information about this planet and others. And so the, guy, the person who was interviewing her just, you know, didn't, uh, didn't really think much Let about it her, yeah. who David Icke was. Right. <laughs> now there's just a big shit storm because she likes David Icke's material. And, and, and you know, immediately – She's being branded a fascist and anti semite I mean, you know, it, it's just because theoretically she wrote David the color Icke, purple that Oprah was in. She's not a fascist or an anti <laughs> No, but because she reads David Icke now, she's right. Now she's got to disavow David Icke. That'll be interesting. Because I don't think she I will. I don't think she will. She's not gonna walk that back. Mm -mm. And because she's an Aquarius, and Aquarians eh, they don't really do that stuff. No. You can't tell an Aquarian what to do or think. No, you can't. No, they will, they'll My push My father back. is an Aquarius. Danny Katz is an Aquarius. You cannot tell these people what to do or no. think. So, so, so this is going to be interesting because, you know, kind of connected to that, we had another thing in the media where Stephen Curry, who, who plays for the Warriors, was on a podcast. And I've been talking about this on my show. And he casually said that, you know, we didn't go to the moon. They asked him, did we go to the moon? No, we didn't go there. So, of course, it hits all the, you know, major sports networks. And, and all of a sudden, they start castigating stuff. How can you believe this? How can you believe Wasn't this? Wasn't there a basketball player a few years ago who started talking about the earth being flat and they did the same yeah, thing? Yeah, that's Kyrie Irving. He was a flat earther. And he, was, yeah. he stood by that for a couple of years. And then he finally walked that back. And, you know, Stephen Curry did the moonwalk back. 
Oh, the moon walk back. You could, but, <laughs> right? That's it. You yeah. did it best Michael Jackson impression? Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting because, um, I mean, he's not the only basketball player that believes that we didn't go to the moon. Right. Like Vince Carter, who's been in the NBA for 15, 16 years. Well, I mean, the basketball players team. have some knowledge about spherical bodies traveling through space. So they well, might they theoretically have should, right? Yeah. And so Vince Carter's now we didn't go. So he's not the only one. Right. He's not the only, you know. But he, is, been, but he is the Christian nice guy one. Well, the interesting thing about Curry is he comes across as the Christian nice guy, <laughs> but he also has tattoos. Ah. You're not supposed to have tattoos, and he does. Ah. And one of his tattoos is the symbol for Pisces. Ah. Because he is a Pisces, and, and all of his family have to have the – he and his wife um, both have the same tattoo. And there, there are stories getting back to sports and MK Ultra, you know, programming. Is that Steph? Well, they, like, they like to have somebody with the moon in Pisces <laughs> for that kind of stuff because I, either the birth sign Pisces. I have my moon is in Pisces, right? right? And I'm a Cancer, which is also a moon sign, right? So, yeah. you know, yeah, they like well, that. Pisces it's is a- valuable. Pisces and Gemini tend to be. You know, Gemini can be compartmentalized, and, and Pisces tends to be malleable. Yeah. Well, the the. Uh, if you read into Fritz Springmeier's stuff where he talks about the creation of a perfect moon child, right? Right. That has a lot to do with that kind of stuff. So there's, there's been some talk for a while that Steph Curry's wife is actually his handler. Mm-hmm. And um, they had these um, awards. I think they might have been the ESPYs, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And so they do these skits and stuff. And there's a, there's a scene that's being sort of recreated from the movie Get Out. And uh, Drake is in the film, or in the in the commercial, in the in the skit, Drake the rapper, right? Who's another kind of you know insider, MK Illuminati, uh-huh. you know, hip hop figure. And they're playing a scene from Get Out, and in the scene, uh, Drake plays Draymond Green, who's yeah. one of Steph's yeah. teammates. Yeah. Every time he wants Steph to get out and come hang out with him, the woman who plays his wife. Uh, in the in the video, starts controlling him, right? right? So, like, it's out. Like, people in the business know, people in the sports world know that. Well, Draymond Green is also a mind control guy. You can watch him. Draymond, that- you went to Michigan State. Oh, you can watch him in that press conference just be completely out of his mind, like completely gone. I didn't know he went to Michigan State. That is really really interesting. There's a theory. There's a theory, by the way. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't confirm it. But there's a theory that his father is actually Magic Johnson. Interesting. So because that's where Magic went. Magic went to Michigan. Magic State. Johnson went to Michigan State too. Okay. So yes, mind control program is being run through the athletic program at Michigan State. I've also heard that his father might be a musician in a band. I mean. So get into that weird kind of programming. Well, with all, with right. half of these basketball players, we never know who their fathers are. They were all fatherless kids, right? right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that came up in a show we did a, lot, <laughs> a while back with uh, Zachary Hubbard, the Gematria guy, right, where he had this interesting kind of theory about a lot of these black male athletes and, or black athletes in general and how almost none of them have the father in their life. And, you know, so they spent a lot of time in these boys and girls programs and whatever. And that was a way to introduce a handler to their life. It's been there all along. Right. Or look at Shaquille O'Neal. You know, Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal, O'Neal, LeBron O'Neal. James, all these people. Right. Yeah. And Shaquille, yeah. And, and Shaquille spent a lot of time around his stepfather who was like military. LeBron, I, I could be re- remembering incorrectly, but I feel like Zachary Hubbard told us that LeBron James and Steph Curry were born at the same hospital in Ohio. That could be. I know that Jim Harbaugh and uh, uh, Urban Meyer were born at the same hospital in Ohio. Yeah. I think that could be true. I think I've heard something like yeah. that. Yeah. So and then they end up these two, you know, the head to head two best players on the teams that are, you know, fe- duking it out and whatever. Like, it's just so fascinating that that's how this goes, right? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I thought that was interesting. It got brought up into sort of the, you know, everything's getting revealed now. Everything. I mean, everything's getting revealed. And this goes back to um, the thing with uh, Google, right? And, and, oh, uh, yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. Holy shit. Um, so the, the guy who's the CEO of Google, what's his name? Um, he had an Indian name. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. I'm going to find out. 
I mean, so you think of Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Uh, I think Larry's gone. Sundar Pichai. Yeah, Sundar Pichai. Sundar Pichai was was at uh, Washington, Capitol Hill, and uh, he was one day, you know, being sort of interrogated by uh, the Senate, and uh, this guy Raskin, who's from Maryland, started to ask him about this video that you that's been on YouTube, supposedly of Hillary Clinton and. Huma Abedin eating the face of a child. What context was this brought up under? The context was, you know, <clears throat> you know, how could you have something like this on YouTube? Right. Like somebody, right. Can't, so, somebody so, can't say. So they were talking about right. censorship. Right. Like you're doing a bad job when it really comes to censorship. This is the censorship right. you should be focusing on. Not the censorship of free speech. Right. But the censorship of these videos, which are contemptible. A, so that's how it came up. Hillary Clinton <laughs> and Huma Abedin eating child. Let's see. That's right. It's it's uh, yes. It's Hillary and Huma. Um, of course, Snopes that, is debunking it. Right. right let's see. Yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, of course, now I can't find it. So that would be a classic, you know, hidden in plain sight tactic. Let's put it out there in this meeting. Let's talk about it, and then let's, you know, summarily discredit it. At a high level, right? Uh -huh. At a high level. Now, supposedly, that video came off of Wiener's laptop. It had been leaked off of Wiener's laptop. Yeah. And that Wiener wasn't just collecting photos and having child porn. They were actually creating it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I was telling you about this the other day when we were discussing what we might talk about here, that, you know, I don't agree with a lot of things he talks about. He's a little bit, his, he comes from a little too much of a Christian bent and a Republican bent for me to really see things completely accurately. But I think he's right a lot about a lot of stuff. And that person is Field McConnell from Able Danger. And he, when I first kind of got into their material, God, must have been six or seven years ago now, I went back and read some of his early material where he sort of explained the way some of this stuff works. And he talked about there being snuff films related to all that were attached to and related to all of these big political events, shooting events, sex scandals, and things like that, that there were snuff films that were made in order to make sure that the blackmail worked, right? And I think that's probably what Anthony Weiner existed as. I think he was probably a point man for some of this stuff that like George Webb talks about, about brownstoning and snuff film, you know what I mean? Like, you know, whatever. But go, if you look into some of Field McConnell's earlier work where he talks about snuff films as blackmail, you know, like it's pretty interesting some of the things he has to say about it. And I yeah. think this would fall under that category. Well, well supposedly the rumor <laughs> that, you know, one of the big snuff film uh, videographers and, uh, you know, photographers was Hunter S. Thompson. Uh huh. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh huh. I mean, if you look at Hunter S. Thompson, the guy was just completely. I think, I feel like Field McConnell also talked about, I, I remember listening to one thing where he was talking about the musician Tricky being involved in a lot of this kind of snuff film kind of thing. If I've I met Tricky. Yeah, that, that there was a snuff film that was shot from the balcony of his apartment that got, showed a different angle on 9-11 than anyone has ever seen kind of thing. He talked about Tricky as being involved in the, like it's the, there's some of these interesting celebrities, people that are kind of oddball, quirky characters like a Hunter S. Thompson or a Tricky or whatever that, <laughs> that may play roles like this. Right. Yeah, I met Tricky in Miami one night. Mm -hmm. At the music, at the uh, electronic music mm -hmm. festival thing. Yeah. And I met him, I met him at uh, Chris Blackwell's mm -hmm. hotel in Miami. Chris Blackwell has a long time reputation of being like Lee Perry has accused Chris Blackwell of being a vampire. Right. Well, he yes. may be one of, if he has a hotel, he could be one of these guys who runs these brownstoning operations like Jeffrey Epstein on Lolita Island or whatever. Right. Well, and Chris a Blackwell had, has a big studio in Jamaica, right? Yeah. Yep. And he's, he's convinced that Chris Blackwell is a vampire, meaning that, mm. you know, he, he drinks human blood. Right. Well, that's what goes on with these people. And Lee Perry, Lee Perry's nuts. So when they hear it, they're like, oh, Lee's nuts. Mm -hmm. But he's insistent. He's also insistent that he had Bob Marley killed. Oh, is that, is that you know, um, that's, that would be another reason to 
do this big painting of Pete Davidson as mentally ill and crazy in the public media because he may have a secret and they want to you know, discredit him before he comes out and says something that he knows, right? It could be, could be, yeah. I just thought it was interesting that Tricky was showing up at uh, yeah. Chris Blackwell's uh, hotel there. Mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was not a nice person. No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think Robert, you had something you said you have to do. So we may have to, I did, I had, it had popped into my mind after we started that it might be. Yeah. I've, I've right. got to go do my thing. You know, I've got to go work. Yeah. Well, maybe, planet. maybe ne next time, or maybe I will on off planet radio or something. I did also want to get into a little bit of conversation sometime about this uh, deplatforming stuff that's happening on Patreon with the whole thing with Sargon of Akkad and, and uh, now with Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin kind of, you know, stepping in and having stuff to say about it, but we can hit on that next time or I'll hit on it somewhere else. And, so we will be out of here, guys. Anything else you want to say before we go, Robert? Uh, yeah, no, just, uh, you know, fasten your seatbelts. You know, fasten we're, your seatbelts, for we're, sure. We're, we're in a different part of the universe now. All right, guys, if you want a phenomenal astrological reading, hit Robert up at robertphoenix.com. If you'd like a health, wellness, and lifestyle consultation, consultation you can find me at Emily Moyer on Facebook, and you can also find me at offplanetradio.com. We will see you guys probably in the new year. Well, we'll definitely see you again, but I don't, I don't think it'll be again in this year. We'll probably be in the, in the new year. Maybe, maybe we'll do one before the end of the year. We'll see. What do you think, Robert? Maybe we squeeze one in. We'll see. We'll see. All right. You guys have a great day. We're out of here. Sayonara. Thanks, Thank you. Take care.